Hi everyone, welcome to the 2020 um, Ohio Anna Book Festival. I'm Claudia Plumley with Great Lakes Publishing and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Hidden Ohio panel. Um, this one strikes straight to my heart as someone who promotes Ohio, so I'm thrilled to, to get to introduce you to these authors. But first off, I want to thank our festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed on the Ohio Anna website. And also a big thank you to our local official bookseller, the Book Loft of German Village. And you can get copies of all of the books we talk about today, as well as throughout the festival there at the, building, at the Book Loft, or you can go online to bookloft.com. Now I'm pleased to welcome our authors. Um, first, I'm gonna go in alphabetical order, but first is Deanna Adams, the author of Rock and Roll in the Cleveland Connection. And then we have Mark and Becky Dawidziak. De I think I said that right, right? Perfect. Okay. Good, cool. good, good. All right. And they are the authors and the photographer from Shawshank Redemption Revealed, How One Story Keeps Hope Alive. And then there's Conrad Hines, the author of Lost Circuses of Ohio. Right. And then E.F. Schrader. And I love, you have my favorite book title, Ghastly Tales of Gaiety and Greed, Unauthorized and Haunted Cedar Point. So I can't wait to have this discussion. Um, and I, what I thought we could do is just kind of start off and, and kind of go over some questions. And for these first ones where everybody answers, maybe just kind of answer by order of like alphabetical order. So, you know, it's Deanna, then, then go to Mark, Conrad, and EF. And, and then of course we'll get more loose. But, but first and foremost, I wanted to talk about, like talk about your featured book and, and why you picked that topic. These are well, <laughs> well, you see, Rock and Roll with Cleveland Connection, this is how big it is. This is not what I started off with. I wanted to, and this is, this was my first book. It came out in 2002, um, and I have a follow-up for this um, that came out this year. But I wanted to chronicle the, the rock history in Cleveland because so many people were asking why is the rock hall in Cleveland and I had done very many articles on it and everything so long story short I didn't know what I was getting into because I ended up with 300 taped interviews that I did on the phone and in person I researched and worked on it for about four a little over four years uh, Kent State Press published it um, like I said in 2002 and it just, it, it was amazing. It was an amazing journey. Uh, and I was, I'm very glad that I chronicled it now because um, so many of the very important people that made Cleveland Rock history have passed and their history is in there. And so it's documented. So I'm very proud of that. That's awesome. Gosh. Oh, Mark, what about you? Well, I have never been right in my entire life about what my next book is going to be. Whenever anybody says, what's your next book? And I'm planning on something. I'm never right. You know, I'm always uh, fake steps in and pushes you into the right direction that you're supposed to be in. And uh, this book actually uh, came out of a much bigger book I was working on, on Stephen King. Um, I was doing a book on Stephen, the film and TV adaptations of Stephen King. And my agent was starting to shop it around. And um, it was actually, it was at a, at a book festival. Hate to say it was not Ohio, Anna. It was at Books at the Banks in Cincinnati. We'll that, forget uh, uh, well, yeah, well, I can't change history. Um, well, I can, but that's a hidden tale. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, a woman named Jerry Goble, Goble came by the, the, the table, and she was the editor of the Mansfield Journal. And she had asked me, what's your next book? And I said, uh, I'm working on a book on Stephen King. And she said, well, you know, they shot the Shawshank Redemption in Mansfield. Um, and next year is the 25th anniversary, two years is the 25th anniversary of the film. And I thought, wow, that's right. It's the 25th anniversary. So, um, I called my agent and said, why don't we pull that chapter out and make an entire book, do a real deep dive on just Shawshank for the 25th anniversary. And then I kind of thought, and this is the serendipitous stuff that always comes in when you're doing a book. I was there. In 93, I was the film critic at the Akron Beacon Journal, and part of my job that summer was to cover the making of the film. The first interview I did, somebody said, ask me, once we get this question, how long have you been working on this book? And my stock answer was 25 years. I just didn't know I was working on it all that time. Um, I, I was... Um, I went back to the very first interview I did for in 1993 on location 
in the shadow of the Ohio State Reformatory was with Morgan Freeman, who was dressed as, as you see him in the background here, as red. And um, so I, I ended up doing about 75 interviews for the book. I interviewed everybody from Stephen King down to the woman who trained the rats for the prison scene. And everybody, everybody had a good story for, the, for, for, for this. I could have gone on researching this book for another two years, easily and happily I could have gone on researching it, but I had to get it done in time for the 25th anniversary. And the other serendipitous thing is um, this person sitting next to me, uh, my daughter, Becky, um, she's a very gifted writer, but also a very gifted photographer. And I needed a photographer and she needed a senior project at Kent State. So I went to Kent State and said, can she be my, 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 my intern? Can she be my, can I use her? And they said, sure. Uh, so her, this book has about uh, 55 pictures in it, some from the film, some donated by people who are in the film, but a good half of the pictures in it were by her. Wow. So, uh, and, and, and believe me, if, if, you're st you're, if anybody's thinking nepotism, uh, the publisher is not in the charity business, you know, they would not have used the pictures unless they were really good, and they are, so, and I think you enjoyed yourself, didn't you? Oh, yes, it was a wonderful summer. Yeah, it was, it was a magic summer. I'm sure you got an A for your internship, too, so that I would have guessed, right? <laughs> oh, oh, cool. Well, Conrad, what about you? What was, um, well, what, tell us about your featured book and why you picked that topic. Yours is fascinating. Well, the, um, you can see the background behind me. It was the Law Circuses of Ohio. And living in Columbus, I had always heard of the Sells Brothers Circus, which in the 19th century, uh, it was the wrangling of its day. You know, people always talk about Barnum. Well, Barnum had very stiff competition with the Sales Brothers Circus. Um, and they operated from pretty much the Midwest, even out to uh, San Francisco. Uh, and when I approached the publisher, I was talking about a lot of the other circuses in Ohio. And they said, well, why don't you include those two? And suddenly I said, well, oh, okay. And next thing we knew it was it turned into all these law circuses that had, it's interesting, as they went out of business, they morphed into Ringling Brothers, okay? Uh, they were the new kids on the block, uh, let's say in the 1890s. And as these people passed away, the, the Ringling Brothers were able to buy up these great services, Barnum, Bailey, um, Four Paw, Sells. And that's, it, it was just a forgotten history because I think in the 20th century, you know, the big game was wrangling. So I just wanted to sort of remind America that, you know, Ohio was the place of, of circuses, of the big circuses. That's cool. Do we have more than, than other, other states, do you think? Or was, well, like uh, that, or was that common? Wisconsin and Florida um, are where the big museums were because that's where uh, the ringlings operated. Um, Barnum, of course, they were out of uh, the East Coast, mm -hmm. but um, for the most part, uh, I would say the center of the circus life is sort of uh, the Baraboo, Wisconsin, and Sarasota, Florida, uh, because that's where a lot of the major history museums are. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Thanks. That's interesting. Well, EF, what about you? Tell us about your book. Sure. Um, so like a lot of us, you know, growing up in this um, part of the world, I grew up in Northeast Ohio. So Cedar Point was a frequent destination for not just me, but my, my whole family. Um, you know, my folks and relatives were crazy about all the, all those destinations from Euclid Beach to Geauga Lake. We were big fans of the Lake Erie Coaster Belt. Um, and in addition to just being a, a carousel horse enthusiast, uh, <laughs> This is probably going to be my nerdiest confession of <laughs> of this talk. You're now um, alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also really love ghost stories. Um, really, really love just spooky, old, strange um, tales and lore. And thought, why not? You know, it was just a little idea. Why not start putting together these 
sort of legends and um, that was sort of the, the kernel of the idea that became the book. Wow. I know we're all dying to know like what's haunted and what's not. So <laughs> I'm just going to jump to that right now because I'm dying to know the answer. <laughs> well, I, th I feel like I have, I have the liberty of, you know, since it's, <laughs> you know, since ghosts may or may not be real, I, I probably am the least tied to, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a nonfiction collection by any stretch. <laughs> There's certainly liberties taken, uh, <laughs> but probably the most, maybe the most famous would be the, the carousel horse uh, from the frontier carousel that used to be in Cedar Point and now is at uh, Dorney. Um, you know, the military horse was a legendary sort of um, place of events supernatural events <laughs> we'll just leave it at that oh, wow. um, but also the hotel you know there are a lot of stories about oh is the hotel haunted or isn't it you know so i just play with um some of those different ideas throughout the book oh wow now mark do you do you address that at all in, in your book with with some of the ghosts that that the reformatory allegedly has no i've left that to other people i i, yeah. I there there is um a tremendous number of my books do fall on the spooky side of the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, for two years running, when I was at the Akron paper, I did a, a, a ghost tour where I went to different haunted places. And um, I'm the same, you know, whatever there is to being sensitive, I'm in the negative category. I have never seen, smelled anything, you know, that, 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 but I've been around a lot of stuff that I have no explanation for. And certainly things happened on that tour. But with this, when we were doing the, there was so much to, to tell in the, uh, the making of the movie that, uh, and nothing really supernatural happened uh, during the making of the movie. Mm -hmm. And they were here, they tested it, by the way, uh, because that movie was shot 95% here in central Ohio. 95% of, most movies are shot on Hollywood uh, studio sets, sound stages, and even when films go on location, they're only there for about, um, you know, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. Shawshank spent three months here shooting, two months in pre-filming and one uh, opposite. So they were here for a combination of about six months total. And it was all that the only thing that was not shot in Ohio was uh, the very last scene on the beach uh, which is supposed to be Zawataneo, Mexico. Uh, that actually was St. Croix. They found a beach in St. Croix to double for Zawataneo. But everything else was shot in Central, was in Upper Sandusky, uh, in Ashland, uh, at the Reformatory in Mansfield. Everything is here. So this is our movie. We, we, this is very much um, our movie. Um, it is even more so than, say, Christmas Story which, you know, a good deal of the interiors were shot in Canada. Uh, so this movie, you know, and it's, and, ev and as I said before, you just, everybody involved, including me, had a, gr had a great story to tell. You know, mm -hmm. the, the people who, uh, because they, they employed a lot of extras from this area. Uh, a lot of prison guards at the, uh, at the OSR played guards in the film. So mm -hmm. they were in the, the, that, that prison a lot and nothing profoundly supernatural happened uh, during, the, the, during the three months. If it had, I would have put it in. You know? <laughs> what I will say though is, you know, the, the very, one of the times we were there for a shoot, um, there's a picture in the book of a Shawshank ghost. It's me. Oh, it's you? <laughs> we, were, we were on the cell block and it was the first weekend of, you know, in October, the Ohio State Reformatory becomes Halloween Central mm -hmm. and they do tours and it becomes the haunted prison for that entire month. So uh, they had all of this dry ice going up through the cell block and they had all of these eerie lights and they had this yellowish light. And um, Becky said, go stand down at, at the end, of, in the middle of the cell block. And I sat right in the, so stood one in the middle of those eerie yellow lights with all of this dry ice coming around me. And you can't tell it's me, it just looks like a convict down there because I was dressed in blue jeans and I was dressed as a convict. Um, 
and she got a great shot. It's in black and white in the book, but it's a much better. You know, it is. It's much better in color. Yeah, oh, it just pops that's... in color. Oh, how fun. That's fun. Well, I know you guys, uh, everybody's alluded to it, but Deanna, gosh, I, I wanted to talk about the research that goes in and, and what everybody's research process is. And yours, oh my gosh, what, 300 tape interviews and four years of that. Tell me a little bit about what you do and how you prep for that, how you found people. Um, I'd love to hear about everybody's process, but yours in particular really fascinates me. Um, I, again, I didn't know what I was getting into because when you, uh, I was a freelancer, so nobody really knew who I was. I couldn't call somebody and say, oh, this is Deanna Adams from Cleveland Magazine or Ohio Magazine. And um, so it was hard to get some of these interviews until um, I talked to a couple of uh, ones that were very much in the, the music industry. And, and once I was able to say so-and-so, uh, recommended that I talk to you. I never, in the beginning, I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book because everybody's writing a book and sometimes they don't take you seriously, uh, especially when you don't have a background yet. Uh, and I'm talking mid nineties. So I spent um, every week, one day a week, I would go to the library. I would do the microfilm. I would uh, print out everything at night. I would um, find sources that way through the uh, different articles and highlight them and make notes um, and so I always did my research before I did the interview to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I asked intelligent questions and I just already knew about them so that, uh, you know, we could get that out of the way. Um, although some things I needed con confirmation from them. Uh, in many cases, that's why interviewing is so important because in many cases, you know, I would say, oh, and I read about this and they would say, oh, that, that wasn't exactly right, you know. So you were able to vet a lot um, from that. Um, but again, just, you know, every week, uh, my kids were in school, my husband was working, so I'd get everybody off to school. And I was also still doing hair. I've been a hairdresser forever. That's what we were talking about other jobs. Um, but now I, I do it just um, a couple days a week, but because I love my people. But um, I was able to manage the time frame. You know, I would get up in the morning, get them off to school. I either went to the library that day or I would do my phone interviews or I would just do my writing. Uh, I always prepped that that night of what I was, what chapter I was working on, what I, I wanted to get in there. And it still took me that long because, uh, you know, I, I usually say life gets in the way, but I pretty much made it, ha you know, made sure that it was like eating, sleeping. It was something that I did every day. Oh, wow. Well, who was, who were some of your favorite people you talked to that maybe some, some folks listening in um, might you know? know yeah, well, um, the big names, it was really, again, very hard to talk to. So um, I was able to talk to people very close to, you know, like, uh, you know, um, Chrissy Hine, for instance, she was in England at the time, but her brother was in the numbers band, which was a, a local band in Kent. And so as much as I talked to him and interviewed him for his band, he said, well, you have to talk to Chrissy's manager. Well, that never happened. So there was, a, there was some blocks in the way. Um, but uh, so I just did as much research as I could. And I had everybody read, uh, at least the ones that I could, read their piece ahead of time. And as Mark knows, uh, and probably others as well, as a journalist, you don't usually have your sources read the, the pieces before they come out. And are, but I felt that this was a book, this was going to be, you know, you can't change it and you can't, you know, put out uh, disclaimers. So I had them look at it and a couple, it was interesting what I found was that I, even though I recorded things and I transcribed, that took longer than anything. Transcribe, I would take notes and put little stars in, in really great quotes so I kind of knew in the tape where it was. But a couple people got their pieces and they said, oh, well, that's not what I said. I said, yeah, it was. <laughs> but I said, but if that's not what you meant, because some people just, they, you know, they get excited about talking about their careers or their, their history and it doesn't come out like they say. It was, it was really a good thing that I did that because then they were able to, to change the wording a little bit and make it more accurate of what they really meant instead of what, you know. 
So um, I, that was an interesting uh, thing. But most of them, you know, were very happy. So I had a lot of happy people before the book came out that they were pleased with it and that they knew it was accurate. And uh, it really helped with reviews afterwards because then they said, you know, Deanna got it right kind of thing. And, and that's what you want, not only for any book, but also for history. Uh, that's why I kind of went to fiction. I could kind of, you know, have more to play with. But with nonfiction, you have to make sure that um, you get it right. That's smart. That was really smart of you. I'm a journalist too. And, and you're right. You don't often share it with a person, maybe for fact checking or accurate right. quotes, but not for the rest. That was really a smart move on your part. Thank you. Yeah. Well, again, it was, you know, when the, your name on it and, and things like that, and you know, and I, and I had a really good press, you know, Kent State Press. Uh, so I wanted to uh, honor them as well. Speaking of honoring, by the way, I wanted to show you, I, I found this in my drawer just a couple of weeks ago. Um, this was a, one of the panel sessions about four or five years ago at the Ohio Fest. So I thought I'd, I'd wear it in honor of since we can't be there for years. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I know. There's next year. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I hope so. Well, Mark, tell us, I know you've talked a little bit about your research, but tell us about uh, what you did, um, too, for research. I, I want to make sure we hear from everybody about that, because um, I think that's such a critical part, especially with documenting, um, you know, true stories here. You know, on the one hand, um, this book, uh, it went very fast once the, uh, the floodgates opened, but getting the, the gates to open were, was tough. Uh, getting those first interviews were tough. That's something which is, you know, uh, this is supposed to be uh, one of the things is the benefits of, of uh, aspiring writers out there. And uh, one of the things that has become increasingly difficult, now I've done 25 books since 1982, and if you don't think my bones just creak saying that out loud. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things about doing a book in the 1980s was it was so much easier to get to people, to get interviews. You were truly three phone calls away from getting anybody. And that's because publicists back then really had the notion that their job was to arrange interviews, was to put together you with the star, the writer, the producer, the director, or whoever. Now you have a lot of publicists who view their role as to keep you from their clients. And it has become very difficult to get through those barriers. You have to be very persistent. And, you know, I knew I couldn't do this book without Tim Robb. And I, I, I had interviewed Stephen King several times, you know, so that helped. Frank Darabont, the director of the film, was at the time notoriously reclusive and difficult to get and wasn't doing interviews. Um, he checked in at the very last second, actually after the manuscript was done. Mm -hmm. uh, he came in, he called and said, you know, I'll talk to you for as long as you want. Um, uh, Tim Robbins, it took a long time to get Tim Robbins uh, uh, to, to commit. But once they started, once they started cut checking in, it's like Deanna said, once you can say so-and-so has already talked to me, then more and more people will talk. The trick is to get the first one or two or three interviews. Locally, it couldn't have been better. Um, Mansfield feels like an adopted town to us. It feels like our hometown. Yeah. We were there the, for our first research trip and um, we did everything that we meant to do that day, but we also did all sort of the fun. We ate at the Coney Island Diner. We, Becky rode the carousel. This is another carousel freak right here. Mm -hmm. uh, she, you know, we went to the Squirrel's Den chocolate shop. Mm -hmm. The second time we went to Mansfield to do interviews and to do research, people were stopping us on the street and saying, you're, you're the, the, the people doing the Shawshank book. And I like, yeah, yeah, I, how do you know? You know, and it seemed like everybody knew. Everywhere we went and everywhere we went, everybody opened their doors to us and everybody agreed to talk with us. And it was wonderful. It was really- Oh yeah. I, I, I really was a magical summer. And every time we went back to Mansfield from Cuyahoga Falls, it felt like we were going back home. And so, you know, we really felt it like we were, had been adopted by the town. And, you know, last year they had the big 25th anniversary celebration uh, of the film and it was a madhouse. I couldn't believe how many people mm -hmm. came in. This film, if you love this film, you really love this film. Yeah. This film has a, a profound connection. 
And the great thing about this film and its connection to Ohio is that, like I was saying before, how many uh, movies are shot on, on uh, sets and things like that, everything gets torn down, everything gets carted away. There's nothing there. Here, the sets were the buildings and places of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So you can go and put your hand on these things. You can go walk the sets of the Shawshank Redemption. They're, all the buildings are there. The Ohio State Reformatory, which is Shawshank State Prison, is there. And they have this wonderful thing. Uh, I'll go ahead and plug this. Uh, Destination Mansfield uh, has helped organize what's called the Shawshank Trail which is 16 filming stops. They have a brochure and you can follow it and it'll take you, you can drive around and go to all the places where they shot scenes from the film. And you know, the heart of it is the Ohio State Reformatory, but there's the courthouse and wood shop in Upper Sandusky. There are places, the bank in, in Ashland. And if you're a devotee of the film, you'd spend two or three days here. And we encountered people who were doing this it was like they were on pilgrimage. Oh, wow. It was like they had a glow and there was a, uh, remember the woman we met up at the bench? Yeah. We were, yeah. It, was, it was a really hot day and we wanted to shoot there. There's a bench in Central Park in Mansfield. It's the bench where James Whitmore fed the pigeons mm -hmm. in the, this, the moment in, uh, in Shawshank. And people make the journey to that bench and while we were there, this, this young woman and obviously her daughter, who, who had to have been like nine or 10, were trudging towards the bench. And uh, we got there first and I said, you know, uh, it's okay, go ahead. You, you wanna take a picture, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, um, are you here on vacation? And she said, yeah, we're, we came from Texas. This is our vacation. <laughs> We're spending three or four days. This is all of our favorite movie. And we're gonna spend three or four days here going to all the sites. Wow. That's I, what we love to hear with Ohio. <laughs> you know, you want people to come here. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's how much fun it was. And then, you know, like, like I said, every time we go back to Mansfield, a little bit of it feels like we're going home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Comrade, what about you? Your research had to really take a lot of a lot of work because so many of those circuses are gone. So tell us how did you how did you find out about them and and kind of unearth their histories? Well there's one word to describe the entire process for me. Lucky. <laughs> um, Fred Finning is second generation circus historian and publisher of the uh, Circus History magazine. And I said, he's second generation. His father, his late father, also published this magazine. Um, and Fred lives in Columbus. Uh, he had read one of my first books and liked it so much. And he just opened his doors, basically his study, uh, which is a, just a, an archive of circus history. And in addition to the uh, Circus Museum in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and also in uh, Sarasota, uh, I didn't have to go anywhere else. Wow. Now, the key thing was uh, I did go to libraries, uh, various libraries, um, but the key thing was the information that I first extracted in my research, and this is where I say I was lucky. I was able to go to Fred Finney uh, for an initial editing, and he was able to point out, sort out fact from fiction. Mm -hmm. This was like, oh, uh, let's just say if you wanted to know what's it like to go to the moon and you had Neil Armstrong uh, <laughs> available to you. <laughs> okay. Because the, the key thing about the circus, circus owners um, were always bragging. <laughs> you know, they, they, were, they were always bragging. 
a lot of what was written was written by uh, uh, newspaper reporters. They were always bragging and stretching the truth. You know, bear in mind, this is a hurry, hurry, hurry. Come and see the biggest and the greatest. Okay. Um, so the information and the histories and the tales, uh, you know, especially for the 19th century circuses, there was really no one to really confirm, you know, how true it was. But from Fred Finning, I was able to get the uh, real spin on so many stories as to what were, you know, wild tales and the like. Uh, an example, uh, one circus uh, owner would say that he lost uh, a half a million dollars in a particular uh, season, okay? Well, believe it or not, he's bragging, all right? He wants to, everyone to know that he lost so much money. So the following season, he's able to come back and say that he made a million, <laughs> okay? So that's just an example of the kinds of things that you have to, you know, really get sorted out. And then to find out, for instance, Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley started with the Sales Brothers Circus in Columbus. And then to research Annie Oakley, um, uh, who's also, you know, local Ohio girl, it was, it was just fascinating, the things to find out about her. Very humble individual. Um, let's see. The circus industry was pretty much supported by Ohio. The posters uh, were printed here in Ohio and distributed nationally. Uh, the trains were built. Um, and these were specialized trains for the purpose of loading a circus within a matter of hours. As a matter of fact, the first such flat car was fabricated in Columbus. And so this was uh, my research process because bear in mind, I didn't want to put together a book about the circus, have it distributed. And there are an awful lot of families who they see the circus as their legacy. I mean, they have their, you know, fourth and fifth generation. Um, they're just, you know, that, that remember, you know, grandma and grandpa and, uh, from the circus. So you, you want to get the facts straight. Well, that's interesting. Well, Eve, what about you? What was your research process like for for your book? I think that would have been pretty fun to to find out everybody's tales about Cedar <laughs> Point and what their experiences were. Right. Absolutely. Of course. You know, it was it was <laughs> it was super great to have so many reasons to go back to the park <laughs> um, <laughs> over and over. Um, <laughs> uh, but a lot. I, I did spend a lot of time at the Sandusky Public Library. Um, looking through, you know, the old newspapers and the Follett House Museum was a big part of some of the early research, as was the Merry-Go-Round Museum. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, the museum at Cedar Point, the Cedar Point Town Hall is, is another place that I, I visited frequently, especially in the, in the early stages, just to sort of capture the mood of uh, the park and the place and uh, the energy. Um, mm -hmm. That was so central, especially um, you know in the Beckling era, um, because you know a, a little bit like Conrad was saying, there there are a lot of these big characters that were you know center stage that really helped the park grow from a, a very modest uh, swimming resort to um, you know and beer garden to this world class destination. And he was one of the bigger figures that I wanted to make sure I, I looked into that time period enough to capture a bit of his energy. Um, but uh, let's see, what other kinds of, uh, you know, I think like Deanna, I also didn't tell a lot of people that, oh, I'm writing this book about, you know, because I think, you know, probably well, sure you are, you know, <laughs> have fun with that. You just want to ride the coasters. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> so I think it was, a, it was a long process of really just getting immersed um, in, in the history of the park. Uh, but also a little bit, I, I wanted to explore um, amusement parks in American history to sort of be able to speak to some of those transitions and changes, um, you know, as, uh, because as we probably know, um, there used to be a lot of parks um, and mm -hmm. now there are far, far fewer, you know, and we used to have Idora Park, which is, is closed and it, it also gets a mention in the book. Um, it's one of the, one of the folks that visits down there. 
Um, so I wanted to be able to capture some of that, some of that energy and some of those changes. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of time at the library. <laughs> yeah. It seems like amusement parks have changed so much since when they started where, you know, just a little rolling hill of a coaster was, was a thrill. And now you have record breakers every year or every other year. So it, was that part of your research too, just like that evolution of a park from, from becoming a real thrill, or, I mean, like really thrilling, <laughs> like that record breaking? Yeah, a little bit, you know, just because I think it's interesting to see what, you, you know, we're paying to be scared, right? So, you know, what, what, was, what was scary, you know, a hundred years ago, yeah. probably wouldn't really, um, wouldn't really work for, for visitors today. So, yeah, it is interesting to see some of those changes. Mm -hmm. You know, they get higher and faster and... Yeah, they seem to defy the, um, to defy odds, right. you know, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's neat. Cedar Point still keeps a couple of their old ones too, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they, they so, have. Yeah, yeah. So and, you can kind of see, compare. Absolutely. And there's so many favorite, you know, everybody's family has a Cedar Point story that they want to share. Everybody, you know, oh, I remember when they had this ride or that ride. So it's, it's really kind of a fun, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess that leads me to, you say that leads me to, to ask everyone, what did you uncover in this, in writing the book that really fascinated you the most? Um, you know, hearing those stories, I'm sure was, but like, what little nugget um, did you hear that just, you thought, oh, that, that was the gem that, that's just really going to stick with me. Um, what, I, do you, Deanna, do you want to start us off? Well, well, first of all, just finding out just how truly rock and roll did start in the Cleveland area because mm -hmm. of the uh, Alan Freed who started playing the music and then he put together the, the, uh, the first, what's considered the first rock concert ever at the Cleveland Arena, but also the process of writing it because it was my first book and you get into it and then you, you start writing it in your head even when you're not at the keyboard. And, when, and then there were times uh, when you would write and you just get goosebumps going, yes, this is really good. You know, this surprises, <laughs> surprises you. And on that note, I, I wanted to say, because EF had mentioned also she didn't tell a lot of people. I tell my students now to, to if you really want accountability, when, when you want to write a book and you really want to write a book, tell people, because that makes you accountable. Accountable. You, you want, you know, you don't want to say, oh, the book didn't work out or I went and did something else. But if you tell people, then you kind of think, you know, I got to finish it now. <laughs> um, but as far as gems, there was all gems all over the place with that book. I mean, there's just so many people that I talked to and their histories were just so fascinating. Um, it, and it was overwhelming. Uh, I took it a, a bit at a time because just seeing the whole, it all in one, it was very overwhelming. So I had to just concentrate on what I was working on that, that day or week. Mm -hmm. oh, but it was, it was fun. The whole, I mean, it was really, really hard work, but it was so fun because I was finding fascinating stories everywhere from everyone. Oh, that's a blessing. That'll keep you going. <laughs> it, it did. Yeah, for four years. <laughs> my, uh, when my book, book finally, when I was finished with the last page, I remember picking up my daughter who, uh, I started it when she started first grade because I thought, okay, they're both in school all day. Uh, and so when I told her, oh, I, you know, mom, you know, that book she's, I'm, I'm writing, uh, I finally finished the last page today. And she looked at me very unimpressed and she said, well, mom, I'm in fifth grade. It's about time. <laughs> She's in fifth grade. It was that long, you know, because you just keep rolling. So. Oh wow, that's funny. What, Mark? It sounds like I, like you found so much that fascinated you. Um, but what was maybe that one thing for you? Well, I, you know, one of the things that I had to uh, sort of answer when I was doing this, uh, we, I mean, we know that the Shawshank Redemption is uh, one of the most beloved films of all time. But you start with the notion that when it came out in 94, it was a box office failure. It, yeah. uh, it crashed at the box office when it came out. Um, it, it was a film which came out at a time when there were a lot of big movies that year. And they sort of took all the oxygen uh, out, of the, out of the room. Uh, number one was Forrest Gump that year. Oh, yeah. Forrest Gump came out the same year 
So did The Lion King. Uh, you know, so did Pulp Fiction. There, it was a big year for movies. And oh, we lost you, Mark. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I said it was a big year for movies, 94, and Shawshank got lost mm -hmm. in the shuffle. So um, people couldn't even remember the film. They, they didn't want to market it. It's not your traditional Stephen King movie. It's not a horror movie in the true sense of the word. So they didn't even know how to market it. They didn't put Stephen King's name on the posters. I mean, it's there, but it's very low. It's not Stephen King's The Shawshank Redemption. It's by, another story by Stephen King down at the very bottom. So uh, one of the things that you know I had to answer was, how did this movie go from obscurity, from being a box office uh, flop, to being the most beloved film of all time? Now, when I say it's the most beloved film of all time, um, I'm, I can back that up. There's an IMDb poll, which is which is rates the favorite movie. People vote. Shawshank Redemption has been number one on that for five years. Wow. It's ahead of The Godfather. Godfather is number two. Boris Gump, by the way, comes in at about 14th now. So Shawshank was the long distance runner. And it was because of cable. It was because of home video that people discovered it. And it really became a hit in 95, 96, when it became a big hit on cable and it became one of the most rented movies of all time. So I had to answer that question was, what was it about this movie that allowed it to uh, rescue itself, redeem itself, if you will, from obscurity and continue to grow in popularity? Now I show the film, I teach a course at Kent State called uh, Reviewing Film and Television. And I show a variety of types of movies, old movies, new movies, all different genres. And I show the Shawshank Redemption and have since 2009, twice a year since 2009. It is the only movie that I show in that class. Becky took the class. Mm -hmm. She did not get the highest grade in the class, oh, by the wow. way. I'm a tough grader. You know, so. <laughs> She's a good writer, but you know, fair mm -hmm. is fair. But it's the only movie that I show that gets close to a 100% favorable response from the students. Wow. Now, in other words, when I get to Becky's class, your age, I'm now showing it to people who weren't even born when it was made. <laughs> They're now seeing, and, and that's a definition of an old movie. That's if the movie true. was made before you were born, guess what? That's an ancient movie to you. <laughs> so whatever was speaking to them, and I think one of the reasons Shawshank is really hanging in there and continues to grow is, and I think this was the answer we sort of came up with, um, is that when the movie came out, times were good. When the movie came out in 94, the economy was pretty good. The job market was pretty good. Generation, as we move into the next generation, they are seeing times which are not as good. The economy obviously is not as good. The job market isn't as good. Everything always seems to be a little bit more challenging for them and that's because it is and this movie speaks to hope mm -hmm. that hope is a good thing maybe the best of things and no good thing ever dies this movie talks about redemption and the possibilities of redemption mm -hmm. through education through friendship which is a big part of the movie the friendship between between andy and red one of the few adult friendships portrayed in a Hollywood movie, which isn't a buddy-buddy movie, an action movie. Mm -hmm. And so many people have told us, I, I, I was, I'm a cancer survivor and this movie got me through. Mm -hmm. This movie got me through an abusive relationship. This movie got me through bad times at school. This movie got me through depression. If Andy could get through this, I could get through this. Mm -hmm. we, we, we interviewed a man from Canada who um, was a social worker and he was uh, battling cancer. So his days were very hard because he was dealing as a social worker. And he said, you know, it, almost every day he would call his wife and say, put my movie in, I'm coming home. <laughs> 
And he actually took the Shawshank Trail. He had all sorts of conditions. The, arth the, the, the cancer had caused all sorts of uh, rheumatoid arthritis conditions, all these things. He couldn't even sit up. They put a mattress in the back of a pickup truck so he could get to Mansfield, so he could take the Shawshank Trail. Mm -hmm. And when they got to the site of the tree, which the tree wasn't even, it, it's just the side of the tree now. The tree doesn't stand there anymore. He was there and tears were just streaming down his face. And he turned to his wife and said, if I die right now, I die a happy man. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many movies have that connection. He's still alive, by the way. Mm -hmm. He's still with us. And that's the kind of connection this movie makes. And there, I, I, I very early in the, 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 I became familiar with the term. Um, a, a, a fellow who was in the film who, who plays uh, the head of the, uh, the Quickie Mart at the end of the film, he told me this term was to get Shawshanked. <laughs> And I, I said, I don't know that I've heard that. He said, it's when you're going through the spectrum of channels and you come on the movie and no matter where you are in the movie, you have to watch it to the very end. <laughs> you just got Shawshanked. <laughs> you know? And so many people have told me, I said, yes, that's right. That's absolutely right. Even if they own the DVD or, or the Blu-ray, they'll watch it all over again. Mm -hmm. you know? And Becky hadn't seen it. No, not until we started the project. Until we started this project. What did you think of it? The first time I, I, I was very impressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you made the connections as we went to these various places, yeah. you know, and, and, was, and was able to record it and uh, for, for the book. So, you know, this movie is always going to be very special to us too. You know, it, it, it speaks to us as well. Yeah. Well, come on. I know we were, we were talking about what, what did we uncover in the writing of the book that fascinated you the most, but what was it for you with circuses that, that really grabbed you? Well, the logistics, a couple things. One was the logistics involved mm -hmm. for a circus to be able to travel from one city you know, overnight, uh, you know, break down, pack up, and then set up and be ready at 10 o'clock the next morning uh, for a show. Um, and the logistics and being able to, you know, feed everybody, uh, feed the animals, just, just you know, the, the whole works. I mean, it was, uh, you know, military precision. Um, and then the, the thing that really opened my eyes was when I was reading about the Walter Main Circus, they're out of Geneva, Ohio, the train wreck that they had in the 1890s in Tyrone, Pennsylvania, uh, that scene in the, uh, toward the end of The Greatest Show on Earth, the movie, that was supposed to be uh, the, the Tyrone uh, train wreck. And just the facts after the investigation to show that, you know, a train in those days coming down a hill and then hitting a curve, uh, the momentum would cause the tracks to spread that all of a sudden you'd have a derailment. And, you know, it, you know it's, the people that were killed, the animals that were killed, the total disasters. Mm -hmm. And then within 24 hours, they were able to collect themselves with what they had and still put on the show. With that mm -hmm. kind of, just that kind of sheer tenacity. Mm -hmm. um, these people were just really fabulous in terms of their, their will. And, you know, you always hear the, the thing about run away to the circus. Well, there's a real sad story about that run away to the circus because oftentimes, bear in mind, this is 19th century. Um, you, know, you know, you had kids that would run away to the circus and uh, within less than a month, they would pass away from typhoid, dysentery, cholera, uh, just any number of things that, they, you, that you'd get along the way. And uh, they would be, you know, buried somewhere near, you know, wherever they, the circus found themselves. And a note would be sent home. But um, it was, it was a hard life, if anything, you know, extremely hard life. I can imagine. 
Yeah, what, what did you find that just really fascinated you the most and in your, your research for your book? That's, uh, that's, such, that's such a tough question because I was just fascinated at so many different turns, mm -hmm. um, not just with the small details of the park history, but the, the region. Um, if I had to sit, pick one thing that maybe surprised me, uh, it was the number of shipwrecks in the area. Um, that was something that sort of took on a life of its own, you know, just like, wow, um, look at all the shipwrecks in this, in this one little section, you know, so I, I think I, that, that surprised me and, uh, and fascinated me. So um, it was a little, um, a little detour in the research that I, I just kept reading more and more about, wow, you know, look at this ship and this ship right up into the eighties, you know, I thought, wow. I mean, I, still, <laughs> So I think I was just surprised and intrigued by, um, by that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't expect that modern day. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, before I forget, I wanted to talk quickly about our backgrounds real quick. I know Conrad, I wanted you to describe what's in your background uh, behind you. What, what is that scene? Well, I'm an architect by profession, uh, retired. And I uh, also taught at, um, uh, Columbus State uh, in the engineering department for 30 years. Mm. But um, I, I took up writing in uh, 2011 when I retired. And I had always had these ideas, you know what I mean? But once I had the time uh, and a new computer, the words just flowed. Wow, that's so cool. What about everybody else? I know Newsprint we've mentioned, but um, yeah, Deanna, Mark, you both have mentioned um, being former news, news writers. Yeah. Deanna, yeah. you wanna go first? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, basically, you know, just, you know, starting out, I was almost uh, self-taught because I only, I, I got my associates at uh, Lakeland Community College and enrolled in Kent and then I, I became pregnant and I wanted still wanted freelance and it, it's funny because Kent State ended up publishing my book and I and I didn't end up going there, you know because and I thought I saved all that time and money not going there but um you know that the press is different than the college but I was just um uh, it's just it's so funny how, where life leads you um uh, so I as far as freelancing you know I interned at a local paper and then I started freelancing at you know uh, pretty much all the periodicals in Ohio but um, and and you learn a lot on your way so I would but I would only I think I, there was about six years that I was really freelancing before I started the book uh, so uh, the you know a lot you know you learn every more all the time I'm still learning about the craft you know just because I'm, I'm writing fiction now too a, a lot yeah. so it's it's all very different and and um, interesting and mm. that's so you know it's we're talking a long time a lot of decades of, of changing things and you know learning as you go <laughs> oh, yeah. Mark? Well, well I grew up in New York and by the time I uh, left for college which was uh, George Washington University um, I knew I wanted to be a writer and I kind of figured out that uh, one of the ways you could get paid for putting nouns and verbs together was to be a journalist. So uh, <laughs> I majored in journalism at, at GW and that, I started my journalism, uh, towards my, worked towards my journalism degree in 1974 and GW is located only a few blocks away from the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this was only weeks after Nixon had resigned the presidency. So journalism uh, schools were doing uh, land office bu uh, business back then. Everybody wanted to be Woodward and or Bernstein and take down presidents. And, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of those didn't last in the business very long, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I followed the newspaper trail uh, for the most part. You know, I, I followed the newspaper trail from the Associated Press Bureau in, in D.C. down to uh, the... Upper East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia area, where I worked for five years at small newspapers. And then I was 16 years at the Akron paper as first their TV critic, then their film critic. And then the last 20 years at the, the Cleveland Plain Dealer as their TV critic. And like I said, that uh, that uh, that 43 year trail came to an end in April and now I'm concentrating on, on books exclusively. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I've kind of been forced into the life I always wanted, which was <laughs> to, uh, 
And I always thought, well, you know, at some point I'll just quit and I'll be writing books uh, full time. And, you know, I, I, I wrote my first book, um, uh, which was a slice of theater history in the early 80s. And it was published in 1982. And when I got that book done, I made a promise to myself. It was so hard to write that book while I was working at writing as the day job. You know, as what I always say is like, look, you know, if you're a bodybuilder, you don't go to the gym at the end of the day to relax. <laughs> you know, you've used those muscles all day. They're tired. And if you're writing all day, you know, for a newspaper, it's hard to write even a postcard at the end of the day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got to the point where, you know, at the end of that first book, I said, I'll never write another book this way again. I'm making this promise to myself. And of course, I wrote 24 exactly the same way. Uh, over the next few years. I just kept going back. I'm not too bright that way, I guess. And uh, so now, you know, for the first time, I'm writing a book and that's what I'm doing. That's my job is to write the book. And I thought, this is pretty, this is nice. <laughs> this is actually pretty nice. And, uh, you know, and I, the first five books, right around the, the same, I, my, I, five of my books are on Mark Twain. Can you mm -hmm. tell? Um, <laughs> I'm not doing this on purpose, um, although I have played Mark Twain on stage for 40 years. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, the, my first book on Mark Twain came out the same time she did, um, the same year, practically the same month. Yeah. You, uh, so, uh, and then she grew up and uh, you know, her interests are writing and photography. And I'll let her speak for herself, but uh, because I don't have my hand in her back or anything here. Uh, <laughs> but I would think if you asked her, you know, what she most would like to do, where the fire is, it would be. I'd love to be a writer, mm. even more than being a photographer. Oh, no. And I'm more into fiction writing, but that's my dream is to become a fiction writer. Cool. Eve, what's your background? Oh, I'm sorry, Deanna. I just wanted to add, you know, that's what's great about being a writer. You can you can be any age. You can start young. You can start when you're retired. Uh, and the most important thing, and, and you don't have to have a PhD or a master's, but you do have to have the passion, the passion to really, uh, you know, love the art and, and the, the creative form. So I just want to add that because I know there's a lot of uh, aspiring writers watching, so. I want to encourage them to do that. Well, yeah, what's your background? Um, yeah, thanks. And Deanna, that's so true. Just keep writing. You know, 100% of writers write. That's what I always tell people. They say, oh, I want to write this or I want to write this. Just write. Just start writing. That's how you do it. Um, I think like a, like a lot of us, uh, I, I, um, I also, it got me thinking about... Uh, about a hundred years ago, being a stringer for uh, local papers, <laughs> I had kind of forgotten about all that until <laughs> some of you were talking about it. Oh yeah, I remember doing that. Um, I think I was in college at a time when uh, I felt like I was surrounded by business majors and everybody just always asking, what are you gonna do with that, with that English degree? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, um, <laughs> write things down. And uh, I, I think I always ended up no matter where I worked, I worked in the nonprofit sector. Um, I worked in, you know, a variety of settings and I, I seemed to always end up writing things. You know, I, I would write newsletters or I would write features to send out to the paper because I still had my stringer contacts or I would end up writing grants and grant proposals. Um, and at a certain point, I just thought, you know, I used to want to be a writer, like write stuff, like other stuff. <laughs> so I just, uh, I guess I just forced myself to, to, um, to pick it back up, to, to get back into it. Uh, I, write, I write mostly poetry and fiction, um, occasionally some nonfiction. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about me. And I, I, I don't think you ever stop. I think you, you, find, you find your writing groups, you find your, your people that you, know, you wanna share your work with, you find the, the workshops that work for you and you go to them. There, there are so many wonderful uh, literary organizations all over the state of Ohio and it's, um, we just really have a, a wonderful and rich literary environment that it's easy to uh, tap into almost no matter where you are, whether we're on Zoom or in person. So I feel really lucky to be here. 
I know we only have a couple minutes left, but some people have been viewing us with pictures behind us. So Conrad, just in, uh, briefly describe um, what's be, what people see with you. What's that circus scene? Well, that is a the ring circus of um, the Sales Brothers. Mm -hmm. And let me guess, get out of the way so people can <laughs> um, Yeah, and you can see here in the 19th century, they would pack crowds of, my goodness, three to 5,000 people. Um, and people would come from a radius of like, you know, 20 miles. And uh, it was just, you know, the extravaganza. And, and bear in mind, you know, no one had seen an elephant. You know, uh, they would come not just for the um, uh, various attractions, but also to see the um, uh animals, exotic animals, which under those circumstances you would never see in life. Oh, that's true. I know, Mark, you've got your book behind you, and then I'm here at Malabar Farm, which is a site from on the Shawshank Trail, um, but Malabar Farm was the home of Lewis Bromfield, who was a screenwriter, and um, and I wanted to segue real quickly into Ohio Lana just launched a new um, literary trail, and um, you can find sites to go to, including Shawshank sites, I believe, um, throughout the state, um, and visit our writers that way, too, which is just a great way to um, to just increase what you want to read and how you can see this wonderful um, state of Ohio. And uh, Malabar Farm here right behind me is just one of my absolute favorite places, um, literary stuff. So anyway, I wanted to thank all four of you um, for joining us today. I really appreciate that. And um, you know, thank you for taking the time to describe your books and your background and, and everything today. And for anyone listening, remember that you can get copies of their books. Um, go to the um, Book Loft of German Village. Um, you can also go to bookloft.com and order their books of the ones you've talked about today and then all of the other ones. Um, Mark, I can't, still can't believe you have 25 books. It's just amazing. <laughs> I mean, you, you inspire me. Um, but thank you again to all of you um, and especially to our festival sponsors and partners. We couldn't do this festival without um, the partners and sponsors that we have. Um, so thanks to them. and. And to everyone listening to, um, and you can go, you know, be sure to check out the other panels too. Everything's on Ohio Anna's website, um, and it's just a great way to learn what to read. So thank you again to all of you. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye.